Uh, g'day, Steve, and welcome to the Love Your Work Festival, mate. G'day, Chris. How are you doing? Thank I'm you. I'm going really, really well. Thank you for uh, for joining us today. It's great. So I'm um, so glad to be here to have a chat with you. We've got a little bit of ground to cover today. Now, mate, I'm not trying to say that you're old or anything like that, but you're a man with a pretty long history in this game, aren't you? Oh, well, I turn 50 next year, so I think right. I am old, officially. Um, so, you know, I've, I've been at, in business uh, uh, very much since um, 1994, so I've been at it for a while. What, uh, what attracted you to the tech industry to start with? Well, my, my first job was uh, electronics. I was a uh, defence electronics technician, joined up at 15 years old when they could recruit 15-year-olds. So that, that got me off on my tech journey. Um, subsequent to that, I, I started a dial-up internet service provider in the mid-90s. It was my first business and then a, a wholesale telecoms provider. Uh, in both those businesses, I actually wrote the first round of software. There was no such thing as CRMs and other the software wasn't available, to be quite honest. So, um, you know, I wrote the initial operating suites of software, um, everything from you know, CRM type things to ticketing systems, hosting platforms, none of it existed. So that uh, got me off of that software away from hardware and telecoms, I suppose. Uh, and it was there, I, I think I got my exposure to understanding exactly what software could do with respect to productivity. Um, that's what I enjoy the most when it comes to, to business, to be honest. Yeah, I'm just thinking back to my days of dial-up internet and that connection sound, da ding, da ding, da ding. That, that's my ringtone. It's the best sound ever. <laughs> I love it. Mate, uh, this is the Love Your Work Festival. So let's bring it back to current day. And I've got to ask you, do you love your work? Oh, I do. Um, I do love my work. It's a pretty binary answer. <laughs> it's, it's as simple as that, is it? What is it about uh, your work that you love? Is it uh, maybe the people? Is it the fact that you're working in a fast-paced technology? Or yeah, look, it's a bit gadgets? of nuance. That. I, I, I have the worst job in the world. I have a, I have a job. I run a business. I, have, I do. Have a, this is my third business um, uh, where we... Um, you know, we invest in companies. So the, the, the best part about that is the fact that we invest in, we get to hear a lot of stories. We get to investigate a lot of technology. We get to hear a lot of the, I suppose, the opinions of people who want to change their own lives primarily. Um, they'll frame it and, you know, wanting to change the world, but they want to change their own lives for the, for the, for the better. If they change the, the lives of people around them, that usually occurs at the same time. But, but my business, you know, has, has monthly expenses, but we get income about every three or four years. So it, it can at times be a depressing business, to be honest, as you kick all this cash out the door. Um, when the revenue checks come in, they're quite healthy, which is nice. So um, it's a little hard to complain, but it does, it does at times get you down when you, uh, it's such an asymmetric flow of cash. Uh, I'm sure everybody that's watching has seen the show Shark Tank, which you uh, starred on. Uh, is a typical day actually like that? Um, I suppose if, if you were to compress it, yes, really. Um, we, we rarely ever have an uh, entrepreneur come in and do a, a dog, you know, do a dancing bear show where they come and pitch us. That's, that's, that's a lot. Um, look, I, I do. I, I really enjoyed Shark Tank. I respect the format. I think it's highlighted entrepreneurship in an exceptionally positive way, um, which is an, an, it's an amazing net benefit. Uh, so my job is essentially what I do in Shark Tank, except we take between, well, if it's really fast, two weeks to make a decision in typical, it's probably three months and slow can be six months. So uh, we invest in early stage technology businesses uh, in, the, in the seed phase rounds. And we, we run a, a, a technology syndicate with about 160 investors who, who invest along with me. So, you know, those decisions are very, very sober. They're very, very, uh, uh, I suppose we, we do them in, in, a, in a very, um, sane way um it's my daughter's inheritance that i'm spending to be quite honest and i'm not going to lose it on them so not quite as they show on the tv screen when you make a decision like that and you go and shake your hand and you walk off into the sunset oh look you, you do at times you hear this you hear, you hear like a, a pitch or you read a pitch deck typically or you, you know you hear about something and you get really excited and then we've had it just this week we had it well we had it probably we let one down last week which we've probably spent about 400 hours on um to be honest you know that, that's a bit depressing and we've just another one that we've actually just uh greenlit today and we've actually just sent out the the syndicate email today they've already spent 160 hours on so um you know it, it's a lot of time and you know you, everyone knows what people cost this is an expensive business to run so and there's, there's a lot of work that goes into it that's 160 hours of loving your work is what i'm taking from you well, it's not on my time it's i've got a team of seven you know six others including me so um now they do all the hard work. I get to make the easy decisions. I get to say, oh, it's cool and write the check. <laughs> Let's bring it back to loving your work. What do you think the, takes the biggest impact on a person's ability to love their work? Do you think it's maybe achieving as part of a team, maybe building relationships or maybe, you know, working with systems that allow them to be their, their best selves, improving their efficiency? 
So um, I have pretty, uh, yes, elements of all those three things you quoted. I don't think there's anyone in particular that I'd, I'd, I'd put at the top, um, and only elements of those. I believe that uh, what people actually want is a fast day at work. I believe ultimately that whilst we get a lot of our personal fulfill, uh, personal um, uh, well-being through professional fulfillment, uh, at the end of the day, we want to get home to our families. Um, and, and everyone's best day at work is the day that goes fast. You get there at eight or nine in the morning, at five in the afternoon, you're like, I've got to go home. That to me is a good day. So if you don't have uh, a set of procedures and set of systems that make the thing you do easy, that day never goes fast. So if you don't know what you're doing, you don't have the tools, it's a bad, every day is a bad day. So for me, it's about uh, driving the appropriate tools, the appropriate training, the appropriate people, team structuring, blah, 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 all that sort of you know stuff um, in order to get those outcomes. My business is quite weird. We don't have a standard business. Like we get re revenue every few years and income, excuse me, and, and expenses every month. So this is a weird business. And a lot of those things don't quite apply to this business. But, but you know, the businesses we invest in, definitely. Yeah. So are you seeing any uh, new innovation trends out there in the market that uh, may be helping to build new efficiencies in the office? Yeah, look, there's plenty out there. I mean, we invest in those things. So, um, so yes, lots. You, you rarely see like a game changer, if you know what I mean. And if there is a game changer, it usually takes a while for, for, for adoption. There's you know, even ma mass and rapid adoption of a Slack or something like that was, is still measured in years, albeit a short number of years now, as opposed to maybe a decade before. So, um, and not every business sort of uh, took to that sort of instant messaging for want of a better word uh, in, a prof in, a, in a professional sense or commerce sense straight away. So, um, but you know, we as an investment firm, we look at, uh, especially given the current environment, we like things, and this is in no particular order, um, uh, telehealth, uh, we like ed tech, we like telehealth because people are home and people probably shouldn't be visiting dangerous places like hospitals and doctor's surgeries. And we've always liked it. So we think the current medical situation is just, you know, it's literally run by the trade unions called the, the uh, Australian Medical Association. Uh, ed tech, we, we like that. We've got several investments in ed tech companies. We like work tools, um, things that get, make, make things easier. Uh, payments is always one because it's, it's such a, uh, a wide open space. Um, we love SME enablement. So gig economy, SME enable, enablement, things like that. And an overall sort of a way to approach those those themes would be things like product-led growth and, and API businesses. So um, we, we've got a bit of a view there that what I would say it's generally uh, uh, putting tools in the hands of people and as many people as possible. Nice. Uh, do you think companies are starting to see the benefits of investing in those types of technologies? Yeah, I think they are. But I mean, there's new companies that come along that start a, a business based on those technologies. So they, they see less, they, they're the disruptor, right? So they don't, they don't see the productivity. They, they just see the new business, if you know what I mean. So I think their, their view of that would be different. Uh, everyone has a, a view that's relative to where they stand in a market and, 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 they're, and they're, be it spatially or, 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 other, or in a market sense. So, uh, so yes, um, we, you know, we see more and more large corporates trying to adopt things and trying to do things clever. They typically don't, sort of probably good for startups. Um, so, so, so yes, um, but you know you have to be aware of the perspective of the people experiencing those uh, and using those tools. So you know, as an investor in companies, as opposed to you know working in one, do you feel it's important for the employees within those companies that you're investing in to actually love their work, or do you think that maybe investment in the programs that help them love their work, which can sometimes be seen to be as like a bit of a nice to have, do they actually get in the way of you getting your return on your investment? Yeah, well, I said there's a few points there. I'll unpack that a bit. Um, I have no idea how to test if someone loves their work. Imagine walking up to an employee. Do you love your work? No, mate, it sucks here. That's, <laughs> that's never going to be the response, right? You've just got to understand. You, get, you situate that brief. So um, I so don't know how to test that. We don't test that in particular. When we go into do DD, we look at things like, do you, you know, do you employ these people legally? Do you have intellectual property clauses? We look at all the, the structure, structuring legal stuff. Are you a payroll tax up to date, et cetera, et cetera, right? There's, there's certain board, boards and forums you can go onto, Glassdoor and others where you can understand if people are bitching about their employment. We usually have quite small companies. They don't they usually feature in those sort of things anyway, at least not in a statistically relevant way. Um, look, I once worked for a very large organization that, that I, I, when I got there, I read an internal survey on that said that uh, it listed the top 10 reasons of why people like working for this, this organization. And I think reason number seven was their job. Uh, and I, I didn't like working there at all. I found it actually quite professionally just demoralizing, to be honest. Um, but the reason that people listed working that why they like working there was 
the free food, the free bus. They could take their dog to work, do their laundry at work. They get their, their pay, their, their stock compensation. And they're like, you know, six or seven or whatever it was, was I am a job, you're right, I suppose. That If that's not one or two, as a manager, the boss, that's an instant fail. What the hell are you doing? Why are you depressing your people there for 40 hours a week or 38 and a half hours a week by doing that? So, um, so I don't know how to test it, but I, but I know it's important. And I, and I know that some, some do it poorly and, and it, it, it'll rock your sock if I name that company, but I don't plan to get sued and do that. <laughs> no, yeah, fair enough, fair enough. So still along that in, uh, the investment line, what about if a company does realise an efficiency dividend from, from a technology investment, who should benefit? Is it the shareholders in maybe getting a, a dividend or is it maybe the workers in now being able to have a four-day week? And getting paid for five. Well, look, I think if the workers want to live in a socialist collective, they should go to Venezuela. Uh, of course, it's the shareholders. Whatever, you know. Sorry, but sorry, sorry, Chris, that's ridiculous. It's okay. Um, uh, look, if a business does well, then the managers, as appointed by the board and as 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 funded by the shareholders, representing the shareholders, will continue to fund the business and do the right thing, get the right people with the right incentive plans, with the right KPIs in place to do the right thing. So. Um, you know, if the workers want to have a better wicket in that respect, they should become investors or founders and get up their ass and do it themselves. What if, would, would the pendulum swing for you slightly if you're in an industry that has a very strong competition for labour and you can't afford to lose those people? Would yeah. your, that swing sway your mind a little bit? Yeah, no, it does. And it's always a competition for labour. and it, it, it always should be. You know, more importantly, it's a, it's a global world, right? And in Australia, we're at the end of the world's longest communication and supply links. We have some of the most expensive labor in the world. We have ruinous energy prices for some ludicrous reason, a level of regulation that is just ridiculous. Um, so we need to understand that we live in a globalized world where all parties play the game by the same rules, or at least what they should do. And we've seen evidence this week where one party's not. Um, so we're all trade exposed, right? So now if you're talking about wanting a four day a week or getting some extra special productivity bonus or some description, well, that person in the favela in South America on the 500 old laptop with a shitty 3G who's out coding and out performing and out, product, uh, out, uh, out, out pacing you in terms of productivity, he's not looking for a four day week. He's had to work six and a half days a week to get a leg up. I'm happy for us to be measured against it. I'm happy we can compete against that, to be honest, but that's where the competition is. So, um, you know, if you think you need extra special ball balls and congratulations because you're doing your job, then maybe you should just understand things a bit better. Bit of a reality check there for uh, those of us that want to be able to bring our dogs to work and get work those four oh, days. I'm, I'm, I'm not saying that's not bad. I'm not saying that's not bad, but 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 where 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 the most where the most likable feature of your job is in your job, where it's number seven out of ten. Uh, I don't mind if there's free food and free buses and all the rest. I think that's really good. I think it's you know I, I actually want our young people to have these amazing work environments, but where it's the sacrifice of the actual thing you do. In fact, it's making up for how shit your job is. Right, that's actually the worst part. Good point. Good point. Let's uh, shift gears a little bit. You know, a big change of late has obviously been the shift to working from home, from working in the office because of COVID-19. How big do you think this shift will be sort of, you know, as we sort of come out the other side of it? Yeah, yeah, look, we've been guessing this question for the last 10 months. We've got about nine months. We've got no idea. No one really does. We're all guessing. I think the one thing we've seen through this entire faux pandemic is, is that the experts are constantly wrong. And not that you shouldn't listen to experts, but you should under you should understand their track record of predict, predicting things. And it's been given it such a novel novel condition, it's it's been tough, right? Um, so, um, but you know, if you can work from home, it's great. You know, it, it, but you know, crops have to be collected, and you know, machines have to be machined, and vehicles have to be repaired. There's only a certain portion of our economy that can actually do that, right? So, you know, we won't you, you won't see this massive wave massive wave of productivity because of it. And I'd caution people that with COVID, I mean, it's not over yet. If, if any of you out there like reading books, there's a guy called Jim Collins who wrote a book called Good to Great. It's quite a, quite a famous business book. And in there, he talked about the Stockdale Paradox. So the Stockdale Paradox is, is about a, a chap who was shot down over Vietnam and imprisoned and tortured for seven years in the Hanoi Hilton, right? And he, he was asked that of all the people who didn't make it out, what was the one redeeming quality of the people who actually didn't make it through that process and, and died in prison? That's easy. They were the optimists. They were the people who said, oh, it's going to be over by Christmas or over by Easter. So we have a highly infectious respiratory disease here with, with that's something that's been the fight a vaccine for 10 years. So when you look at the vaccine talks, we have to be prepared to understand who's going to take this vaccine in, in lieu of a larger cohort being tested. So that's going to uh, affect our return to normal. 
Um, and, uh, you know, so this, this isn't over yet. And we have a, a situation where the politicians have won elections on their ability to be quite harsh with us and lock us up. So it seems to be electorally popular to, to, to crush economies when this thing gets a little bit, um, in, in, in their view, out of control. So, look, I, I think this is not over yet. I think you need to understand that, you know, in the next 18 months, um, and we're talking to US businesses, we don't plan to have a person in the office at all in 2021. They still think they'll be out of the office for the entire 2021. So, even with a vaccine. So, this, this is not over yet by, by any imagination. And I think if you're optimist and saying it will, you need to plan for it not to be, is my point. I think you have to, you have to rejoice in the fact that one day it will be. But if you, if you can pick that date right now, then I'm yeah, sorry, nine, 99 times out of 100, you're going to be wrong. So you're telling me I need to stock up on my pyjama pants to be able to work from home for a bit longer? No, probably if that's what you wear, I'll lock yourself out. I'm all good. <laughs> it is a bit of a problem of mine. Now, speaking of problems, you know, staff retention is a key issue in terms of ensuring workplace productivity. You know, SaaS companies like us, we always talk about our software improving productivity and efficiency. What tech are you seeing that helps companies specifically address the problem of employee retention? Yeah, look, I, retention, specifically employee retention, I don't know. I, I'm going to go back to my previous answer in saying that if you give your employees just a, a super productive day, like they get there at you know, eight in the morning and leave at four or five, whatever it is, and they go, oh, wow, I have got forgot to have lunch. It was such a busy day, right? And I, I feel good about it. I get home. You know, I feel like I've delivered value then that it's those tools that do that. So the, our example here is that um, post March, when we, we started work from home here, because you know, flatten the curve and all the stuff that never really happened. Um, we uh, wanted to understand what our staff were doing. So we implemented a very light handed time sheeting solution, for example, so we get under, now we, now we know exactly how many hours, I was telling you how many hours we spend on deals, we know that now. So we get to do that. We, we have, uh, we've implemented Salesforce, we were doing that beforehand. Um, as, as, as an over-encompassing sort of CRM solution for our, for our business, which has been very enlightening. So we get the dashboarding that comes through that. So there's lots of things that make it easier to give visibility, to give what I call telemetry in the processes. So everyone can understand how it's going, what they need to do to fix it. And they need enough, they've got permission to fix it. That's back to management again. So and knowing what to do is interesting, being allowed to is another story as well. I was wondering whether maybe it might be something along the lines of making sure you get the right person the first time every time with, you know, so maybe at the front end of the whole process that maybe that's the software. Yeah, but we've all been, you know, you call me, that goes without saying. So, you know, you don't deliberately go out there and employ threaded aliens. Um, they, they, they still turn up, however, if you know what I mean. So, um, and, and even people, the one thing investing in startups has taught me is that stress is a weird thing. No, no business plan survives contact with, with a customer, right? And, and the people who pitch and we invest in, uh, you know, I have so much respect for them all. But you know, when things go wrong, I mean, you know, they're potentially facing bankruptcy. We can't under we can't just light-handedly talk about failure here. Right? So that produces stress, and stress is a weird thing. And I, I fly helicopters, and, and, and there's this, and when you fly helicopters, there's this concept of well, there's a physical force called precession, which is about gyroscopes. When something spins really fast, if you push it one way, your force actually comes out right angles 90 degrees. It's a weird thing, you know. Newton probably figured out why. It doesn't matter why. Stress is like that. When someone's under stress, and you push them, it comes out at a weird angle. Right, so um, so you, you need to you need to you need to look at that and understand that it's not just founders, but also employees and other people that when they're when they're not performing, not productive, or, or not being don't have the visibility from their bosses that have done a good job. That, that stress is a weird thing, and when someone's under stress, it's never their best day. Fair enough, mate. I've heard this so much lately that disruption is is supposed to create opportunity during these crazy times. You know, opportunity for entrepreneurs, opportunity for investors, and you know, in, innovation is is rife. It's it's all over the place. It's probably a good thing in some stages, but during COVID nineteen, do you think that maybe we've had too much of a good thing, or is that exciting you? Um, well, we've definitely had too much of a good thing. Um, <laughs> you know, do we do we do we need um do we need a um um a mole pandemic to come through that you know shuts down economies and puts us into, into into world war ii levels of debt no we don't no we never ever ever need that right that was um will some good come out of this at the end of it you know probably we'll all wax lyrical in three or four years time and say well i wasn't a good this accelerated this and that let's just remember what happens on the side of that, uh, of that acceleration what actually happens there is business failures business closures stress probably suicides and a whole bunch of other things and i'm not trying to be light of that in fact i'm you know it, it worries me a lot um, so that, that, that creative destruction in business is a good thing, but you cannot forget the, the toll that is dragged along behind those really cheap and easy words. So, um, yeah, definitely, like we just 
look, we, we don't, let's face it, COVID-19 hasn't actually caused these problems. The, 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 the overbearing government reaction to COVID-19 has caused these problems, right? So these are self-inflicted um, and, and we need to really understand the, the exact root cause and how we can fix that if we choose to. So some of the opportunities you've been pitched of late, uh, how excited are you on a scale of one to 10 of what the future holds in, in your space? Although I've never not been excited, to be honest. I mean, there's always, you know, I'm, 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 we invest in technology, but I'm somewhat technology agnostic. It's weird. I, I don't care what, what computer science you use to deliver your, your solution, providing it's the latest and most highbrow computer science. It's always the best. It, it really is. So, um, uh, so you know, we, we mentioned a few things before. You know, we're, we're really liking that sort of SME enablement space. We, we think through this and through the, through the disruption, I don't know, overused term, of COVID, um, there'll be a lot of opportunities for, for businesses to get in there and create niches. So anything that can enable them in payments or invoicing or whatever it might be, um, do better. Then that really that really excites us. And then if that's product led and or if there's an API basis to it, we, we get doubly excited, I suppose. Any any broad themes around uh, what might help us enjoy enjoy our work uh, more in the future? Um, no, 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 no broad themes. I mean, I think that um, uh, well, once again, I'm. I'm Bit, bit old fashioned, a bit traditional. So I, I think that, you know, as a manager and, you know, there's, there's things you do in business, there's got goals and aims and you want to actually sort of lead from the front and make sure everyone's on, you know, on, on the bus, which is another another Jim Collins term. Um, so, and, and doing the right thing and they set that fly well up. But ultimately, the the day-to-day -day work of managing, you know, you can make it sound sexy and I'm sure Lifetile does a good job of that. But um, ultimately what you need to do is you need to get product out the door, revenue in the door and bills paid. So um, that's what it is all about. You know, from successful business comes wealth. Uh, with that, the people who get that wealth go back and create more successful business and more and do better in the community. So when you when you have a in a, in a in, you know in a vibrant capitalist society, you, you drag a whole bunch of people along in your journey, which is a really really healthy and beautiful thing. Um, and so we need more of that. So anything that can enable that, and that can enable. I, I don't like big business. I don't like government. I don't like big business. I'm a bit of a libertarian. I don't like big business because they tend to be very dumb in the way they work. Um, and, and in Australia, with that level of regulation, we tend to over-regulate. Therefore, we make it harder for, 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 for smaller businesses, startups, to take on bigger businesses. So there's only one thing the CEO of a large business fears, and it's not a prime minister or even a regulator, to be honest. It, it's actually a small business taking his revenue. So if you want to fix the behaviour of large, large businesses, banks would be a good example, then you're, you actually remove regulation, right, and you allow smaller businesses to compete with them and take their business that will fix their consumer practices, which, which is what we're talking about when it comes to poor behavior. So that's one example, less regulation, more room for business to operate, uh, and then you'll see more software, services, solutions, et cetera. Fair enough. Now, mate, I've got a very hard hitting question to end the interview today. If Channel 10 brings back the next series of Shark Tank, are you gonna be a part of it? Yeah, I don't know. Um, I, oh, I would if they asked me, to be honest. You know, it was always a season by season thing. Um, really enjoyed it. Um, thoroughly enjoyed four years. Uh, got to meet, you know, I, you know, we did about 80 to 90 pitches. In the first year, we did 110, and it was 80 to 90 in the, the third, in the last three seasons. Every year, you meet amazing people. Um, they tell their story. They literally, you know, they're, they're putting themselves out there. They're putting their lives, so all their hopes and aspirations are there. Um, and sometimes I need to come to Jesus, uh, you know, um, um, slap in the face, as in, you know, not a, not a physical slap in the face, excuse me, but I, uh, what do you call it? I, um, come to Jesus moment. Come to Jesus moment. It's like, you have a shit business. You should stop doing that. Well, that's a great business. Let me invest. Um, either way, you know, it's advice and you're free to ignore it like 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 always in life. Don't don't take it to heart. Fair enough, mate. Look, it sounds like you certainly do love what you do. I loved hearing your opinions here this afternoon. Steve Baxter, entrepreneur, innovator, investor, and uh, Shark, thank you very much for your time here at the Love Your Work Festival today. Thanks, Chris. Cheers, mate.